Thank you very much. Uh, great pleasure to be here again. Thank you for inviting me back. Can you imagine having a friend like Tim? <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Tim uh, mentioned uh, middle-aged doomsayers, uh, hopeless at predicting the future, and uh, a bunch of other things. The seed of adventure. And I'm not going to talk about most of those things, but uh, my talk today is supposed to be uh, in relation to global megatrends for the environment. In other words, thinking about the, the future in relation to environment and human health. So, so really, I guess what I want to talk about is what might happen in the future and, and can we change it? And of course, a lot of what I'm talking about is in the media every day about climate change, biodiversity loss, all of those things. So a lot of the themes are not going to be uh, brand new to you. But I do want to just try and give you a bit of a flavour of what I think uh, is coming along the line and maybe suggest something about uh, how we might change the way we think about them. Uh, when Jonathan was, was asking me about um, speaking, he was saying that uh, can we look at some of the issues that we're confronted with. And I think uh, this provides uh, one of the, the first examples, which is we've had an extreme uh, weather event in Europe and around the world uh, this year. And you can see that these uh, trends in upward temperatures and extreme events seem to be increasing in the future. And so that's a mega trend. And so what do we do about it? Well, I'm not entirely sure what we can do about it now with climate change uh, progressing as it has done. But let's also remember that our future might be this as well. It seems remarkable to me how quickly the very, very severe winter uh, this year was forgotten after the extremely hot summer. And uh, when you put these things together, is it climate change? I mean, are, are these extreme events actually being driven by climate? Are we going to see uh, these trends continuing into the future and becoming more extreme? And the conventional wisdom now is that, yes, that is the case. And if, what are the causes of it? Well, it's the, the thing that we've been talking about for a while, and that is uh, the vast increase in the global population, and uh, particularly the amount of resources we're using from the planet and the energy that we're using. Uh, this picture, is this, this laser pointer isn't seeming to work. But, um, but you can see around about 1950, uh, energy use has rocketed. We're still using a lot of non-renewable resources and these trends seem to be uh, continuing. If you actually look at it in terms of uh, extreme events, uh, extreme temperatures, then you can see again, round about 1950, we move into the red and upper part of this graph, where you can see that the extreme temperature events are increasing, and it correlates extremely well with this dramatic increase in energy use. Nothing new there, except it just seems to be continuing. So I think as a mega trend, let's learn to live with it, uh, let's try and do something about it, but um, it's there. And associated with this climate change risk, again, you're all familiar with, are the trends in, in risk, so risks of coastal flooding, river flooding, crop yield, impacts, um, heat-related morbidity and mortality, all of, those, all of those risks are increasing. So as a trend proceeds in rising temperature and in climate change, all of those things are going to be increasing. So this is a doomy bit of uh, the talk. But somehow we have to relate these things to um, experiences that we, all us individuals in this room, uh, come across. So there may be global megatrends, but what does it mean for us as individuals? Infectious diseases seem to be spreading uh, due to climate change. And there's one in particular I'd like to mention, and that's uh, West Nile virus. First really um, evident, I suppose, in South Africa, in Cape Town, where they had this, these epidemics. West Nile virus infects quite a lot of people. Uh, it's a mosquito-borne in infection. Um, one in, well, about one in five people who get the, the virus on board have symptoms, and a significant number go on and, and die from it. Uh, it's in the United States, so they spray for mosquitoes in New York State each year to try and keep West Nile virus down. But the intriguing thing for me as a new kind of trend and something that we're, we're seeing much more of is the fact that West Nile virus is in Europe uh, increasingly. So 126 cases in Serbia, you can read the figures yourselves, Italy, 123, Greece, Hungary, Romania. There are increasing uh, incidences of West Nile virus and it's probably driven by climate, 
because uh, we're seeing more mosquitoes in places. Even in London, uh, where, or even in Britain, I should say, in southeast Britain, we're seeing this mosquito, uh, which transmits the virus, appearing. It's been recognized at different sites, and it does seem it's on its way. And this is just one example of an incredibly broad range of infectious diseases, infectious to human beings, but also to uh, wildlife, and even uh, to, to plant crops and so on. So this is a, a mega trend, it seems to me, that we're going to have to be much more alert for. But those are kind of the conventional wisdom about climate change-y kind of risks increasing in these <laughs> pro progressive trends. And um, it's the unexpected stuff that I think is really also very interesting. For example, who likes onions? I guess everybody likes onions to some level. And we can see that onion prices, because of the extreme events of the summer, are going to rise by about 40%. And there have been many, many increases in the prices of um, foodstuffs in particular as a result of these extreme events. And we don't really kind of talk about that in the sciencey world, but it's uh, an enormous impact on society and will have consequences, particularly consequences with the socioeconomic gradient that we see in our societies. Lots of uh, very poor people and a few extremely wealthy people. And these tensions are going to be magnified, I believe, by climate change. And it's clearly not just climate change. Some of you, I'm sure, went to um, Professor Hugh Montgomery's talk last night where it's kind of full of extreme doom. Mine is slightly less extreme doom, but uh, still a bit of doom. Um, this is the, the famous picture of um, you know, fish in plastics uh, that David Attenborough made so, so clear. Intriguingly, uh, back in 2001, I worked for the Environment Agency in the UK, and we produced two reports in that year on plastics in the environment. And we told everybody about it, and nobody was interested at all. So there must be a sweet moment when suddenly these issues become of, of interest to the public, and if only we could understand why issues suddenly garner uh, public attention. Maybe it's you know, making TV shows, maybe it's... Uh, individuals who have an authoritative voice that people believe in. Maybe it's all of those things. Um, perhaps that's how issues come to the fore. But I want to just uh, tell you a little bit about microplastics because I think it's uh, a trend that uh, we're stuck with. Clearly, there's lots and lots of plastic being produced around the world. This is just a picture of a few fragments of, of microplastics. But what's intriguing to me is that we've got so locked into this trend just as we got locked into climate change, that we forget about other things. So had you been uh, kicking around in the, in the late 50s and early 60s and heard Rachel Carson talking about chemicals and pesticides, uh, wiping out wildlife, uh, birds of prey, and all of those kind of things, then you'd have probably had a strong feeling about the need to be careful with the chemicals we put in the environment. Interestingly, with climate change and biodiversity loss and the population issues that we talk about all the time, chemicals have kind of got lost. And plastics are perhaps the first appearance of a, a chemical substance, as it were, that's uh, got public attention again. What's, what I think is a trend that will emerge in the coming years is that it's not just plastics that are in the environment. These chemicals are still there in ever-increasing amounts. And this is a mega trend globally that I think is deeply important. So imagine that you could make visible all these invisible chemicals. So this is polychlorinated biphenyl. There's going to be a bunch of letters appear. It doesn't matter what they are, but they're all different kinds of chemicals. So cadmium, uh, for example, and antibiotics that we take, we pee and poo them out into the environment. They're in, in the environment too. Uh, nanoparticles, these tiny particles are out there. All of these things are out there. Polyaromatic hydrocarbons, that's what comes out the exhaust pipe on a diesel or petrol car, and so on. Um, bro brominated flame retardants, those are the things that are sprayed on your sofas to stop them catching fire and on night clothes and so on. So they're all out there, and there are 80,000 chemicals in common use at least. And if we could visual visualize them all in the same way that we visualize plastics, <coughs> then you might be concerned about those as well. And maybe we can get David Attenborough to do a program visualizing the 80,000 chemicals out there. But it is a mega trend, and it is increasing. So global trends in chemical production, 
Though it's worth about $3 trillion is the production of chemicals around the world. Global plastics, 335 million metric tons produced in 2017. And um, the most important thing is that uh, since 1950, there's been a 50-fold increase in global chemical production. Just think about how, how great that production is. And uh, it's set to triple again by, 19, uh, by, by 2050. We are flooding chemicals into the environment in which we live and, and our children grow and so on. So all of these issues are important. This is just to show that chemicals do nasty things to people. It's not just, you know, they're in your body and let's not worry about them. They actually do make people incredibly ill and uh, produce nasty illnesses. I mentioned antibiotics. Um, one of the uh, issues that, for example, the Chief Medical Officer of the UK has raised is about antimicrobial resistance in the environment. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this, but simply to say that deaths attributable to antimicrobial resistance by the year 2050 are shown here, and it's about 10 million deaths worldwide due to uh, people getting infected with a bacterium that we don't have antibiotics to deal with and so on. And trends in biodiversity loss, this was mentioned in the lecture last night, 60% of mammals lost since 1970. Horrendous, but there's a perspective thing to have on all of these, and that's what I want to talk about for the rest of my, my uh, talk today. So whilst 60% um, of mammals lost since 1970 is an extremely disturbing figure, and is something we need to do something about, and we've got progressive deforestation and so on, but in terms of animals, 95% of animal species are not vertebrates. They're invertebrates. So these tiny things like worms and soil microarthropods and shrimps and crabs and stuff like that. So 95% of the species on the planet are invertebrates. So when we're saying that the vertebrates are being lost, it's horrible. When we're saying that this many mammals are being lost, it's horrible. It's probable we're losing a lot of invertebrates too. But let's just keep some sort of semblance of... Uh, judgment on, on the whole issue. And when I was look, thinking about these things, I was thinking that actually there are quite a lot of different kinds of megatrends and we don't really distinguish between them very well. So I guess um, when, when Jonathan asked me about talking about what's coming down the line in a sort of a, an environmental context that might affect health, then those are environmental megatrends. And there's this index that came out recently, the Living Planet Index, that's supposed to tell us about how horrendously the environment is declining. But there are also social megatrends. People behave now in utterly different ways. Um, people are now choosing, for example, to buy electric cars. And there are some megatrends that are definitely going to happen. You know, uh, it's all very well predicting the future, but some things are actually going to happen. For example, we put carbon dioxide in the environment. It is dissolving in the sea. It will dissolve in the sea. The sea will become more acidic and we'll have ocean acidification. That's definitely going to happen. It's not in doubt. It will happen. But there are other um, trends. Um, for example, chlorinated fluorocarbons used in refrigerators and so on that we might be able to do something about. And in fact, we have. The Montreal uh, Protocol was a way of limiting their release. So although it looked like everything was going up, we changed it. And it's that changing stuff that's important. So we must recognize, I think, with megatrends, what we can change and what we can't. Um, yeah, just a little thing about global population. That's something that we're not going to change anytime soon. And at the lecture last night, I heard quite a bit about the idea that we've got to control global population. Well, you know, I'm really not sure this is a, a, an area that we can take as simply as we've put forward uh, or is very often put forward. I mean, how do you actually control global population? In the main, the reason global population is going up is not because of more babies being born, but it's because less people are dying as, as soon as they were in the past. And if you look at fertility rates in most countries on the planet, they're going down below replacement value. Not in all countries, but in very many countries. So, you know, these are the predicted scenarios. There are a whole variety of different scenarios. There are a number of things about um, our lives, though, that you could view as positive. So in 1914, you had a 1% chance of living to 100. By 2007, you have a 50% chance of living to 100, and that's increasing all the time. So the global population is probably going to be going up 
anyway if we don't start culling older people. Um, mortality rates as well. Uh, the mortality rates for 65-year-olds in 1922 are very similar to those for a 78-year-old today. So these are, one, one could say, improvements. And then there's a, the other issue about megatrends is which, megatrend, which countries will influence megatrends the most. So Europe represents about 7% of the global population. Uh, and when you look at countries like China and India, they represent something like 40 to 45% of the global population. And whatever happens in those countries are going to be dictating what the global megatrends are. And that's going to change over time as well. Uh, if we just jump between these two things, if you look at Pakistan, which is, in terms of global population, about fifth on that list, six is it, six maybe, um, it's going to be moving up the list. Same with Nigeria. Nigeria moves up to third in terms of global population by 2050. What's happening in those countries is going to be far more important on global megatrends than, than anything else, really. And then there are choices to be made. Uh, we know that we've got people who are undernourished in large parts of the world and people who are overfed in other parts of the world. How do we make choices about how to deal with these issues? What do we do about waste of food? Um, so I won't dwell on this, but simply to make the point that there are these trends. All of that is negative. And I really like this quote by um, Chuck uh, Poluniak, I think that's how you say it, who I think wrote, wrote Fight Club. Um, but anyway, it's an interesting quote. When did the future switch from being a promise to being a threat? Because we always used to be sort of optimistic about the future, but now we just do do doom, doom, doom. So what I want to talk about in the last um, little while is uh, dismantling pessimism. Because we've heard quite a lot about um, all these terrible changes that are taking place. And we shouldn't underestimate them. But the key thing is, we know how to do something about all of them. Absolutely every single one of the problems we face, we know how to do something about them. So just to skim through these very quickly, trends in renewable energy. Look how renewable energy use is increasing around the world, increasing dramatically at a great rate. If you look at um, changes in lifestyles and new technologies, this report came out from the IPCC recently talking about the changes in lifestyle that we could make which would greatly alleviate the problems that we're facing. We also have uh, developed technologies. Here's one example of greenhouse gas removal. We have technologies that can remove greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide in particular, from the atmosphere and make use of it for other things. These technologies are proceeding very, very rapidly indeed. And so there's, there's a possibility of doing that. Recycling. So we talk a lot about recycling. It may or may not be a smart thing to try and recycle everything. Probably it isn't. We're making some progress with it, uh, but not vast amounts, I have to say. But you can see the, the red lines are showing where improvements have been made. Quite often, it's best not to even try and recycle something, but instead to get the energy back from it by burning it at incredibly high temperatures and dealing with the gases that are emitted. I've been working a lot on this whole issue of, of chemicals recently, and we came up, um, a little sort of group of advisors to the British government, with what we could be doing about um, our waste chemicals that are entering the environment. And we came up with a kind of a pretty typical list, like saying, this is advice to government, reduce the amount of chemicals you put in the environment, recycle, uh, limit chemicals that bioaccumulate, all of those kind of things. And then we got to the end of this list and we thought, hang on, we're doing that already. We're doing all of those things already. And yet we see the environment and our bodies and wildlife getting increasingly contaminated with environmental chemicals. So the issue isn't that we don't know what to do. We're just not doing it intensively enough. So we're trying to uh, gear up governments, um, not just in the UK, but around Europe and around the world, to intensify dramatically the efforts to reduce the release of chemicals into the environment, to rapidly increase recycling rates, to stringently prohibit the uh, release of persistent and bioaccumulative chemicals and so on. So these are trends that I think are now being picked up on. Fresh water production is going up. You know, we've always had this constraint on the planet about um, a very small proportion of the water on the planet overall is fresh water. But now with desalination technologies, 
which are now much cheaper, much less energy intensive. It's now possible to produce very large amounts of fresh water by converting seawater into fresh water. What about uh, aquaculture? I think this, is, uh, this slide was actually shown last night by uh, Professor Hugh Montgomery, but in a slightly different context. He was pointing out that if you look at the orange bit, then uh, capture fisheries, uh, the amount of fish caught by fishing boats and so on, has leveled out, and that any increase in production of fish um, is by aquaculture, and that aquaculture now more or less equals uh, the, the amount of fish caught in, in fishing nets. The interesting thing about this is, though, that aquaculture can now be done anywhere. You don't have to be by water because you can recycle the water in an aquaculture facility, filter out all the toxic chemicals. So you can do it anywhere. You can do it in the middle of a desert. You don't have to grind up small fish, who, as, as was suggested, uh, has been used in practice uh, by many people in the past. Now you can use plant material to feed fish to produce healthy, tasty fish through aquaculture anywhere in the world at a reasonable cost of transformation in the production of fish. Trends in health and well-being. So more and more people are getting aware that natural environments really do significantly, significantly contribute to fostering improved physical and mental health. This is a mega trend. It's happening all over the world. It's continuing. And I think we'll see a lot more on that. High-tech farming, I could talk about that for ages. Um, I won't go through this except just to say there's a very sophisticated um, analysis now of the factors in society that influence the kind of foods we eat, when we eat it, what we want to do with that food, how much we waste and so on. So there's a trend in increasingly sophist increasing sophistication in how we deal with these food resources. Technological transformations, just simply to show that in New York in 1900, uh, in the top picture, there were all horse-drawn vehicles and horses everywhere. By 1913, there wasn't a single horse-drawn vehicle. Everything was motor cars. So in 13 years, a massive technological transformation. If you imagine schools today, kids may often be gathering around computers and learning stuff. In Japan, they're already using robotic teachers in schools. So technological transformation. And when you think about the, the internet and... Uh, AI and all of these areas, in 60 seconds, you know, you get something like, what, what does that say? Uh, 694,000 uh, searches on Google every, sec every 60 seconds. Uh, amazing increase in the use of computer technology, AI and so on. The use of algorithms, artificial intelligence. The key point here is, though, this will transform the way in which we can monitor both human health and well-being and the environment and the relationship between the two. So this is a trend that is developing. It's a very, very positive trend if we actually put into uh, action measures that ensure that our health keeps improving and the environment becomes more sustainable. And uh, we've got a step change going on in forecasting with the marketing companies around the world. They, they, they forecast our buying habits and our our behaviours uh, with such accuracy, long period, long times ahead now, if this is done more extensively in the future, as I'm sure it will be, it'll have huge implications again for health and well-being. All positive developments. And then there's the issue of whether megatrends will be realised. So although we see these trends going on, uh, there are some question marks about which ones will be realised and which ones won't be that I think we need to keep our eye on. For example, this talk about electric vehicles, great, but when you look at um, you know, many of the roads in, in UK cities with uh, terraced housing, nowhere to park the car, and all of that kind of thing, it's going to be quite a, a leap to try and get electrical charge points or some mechanism of charging your car in these random parking spots in crowded streets, which is a typical sort of situation in most uh, urban environments. So will it be realised? Can we actually reduce disease? Um, so far, we've, we've managed to reduce re diseases around the world, uh, lack of access to water, lack of access to food to some extent, but it's been at a snail's pace. The number of children still dying from lack of access to clean water or lack of access to decent food is still enormous and has been for, for 
years and years and years, and so on. When we talk about these global trends, I think it's very important to have in mind the big picture, the global uh, planetary health, but it's also about impact on real lives. And uh, any talk of thinking about the future environments that's get, that we think might happen, or more importantly, the future environments that we desire, are going to be strongly influenced by the future of human societies. They, so we, we need to make sure that we're understanding the interplay between what's happening in the environment and what's happening in our human societies as we go forward into the future. And the final, final point I wanted to make is are there beneficial trends in behaviour change? So we can stand up and talk about all these terrible things that are happening to the planet and warn people you need to do something about it and even advise them on what could be done. We can also talk in a positive way about all the positive trends and how the future can be great. The problem from my point of view is, though, that I don't think that the vast majority of the public are sufficiently aware of the issues, have much interest in it. And so I kind of view us, the public, all of us being the public, as being a bit like a soil that's not being prepared properly to receive seeds that will grow. And by seeds, I mean the ideas about we need to deal with one problem or take an opportunity to do something else. Those ideas that we implant in society are not flourishing. They're not generating behavior change. And so for me, the real challenge is we're not ready for change at the moment in our societies. And what are these barriers and how do we overcome them? How do we prepare the soil of um, society, as it were, to receive these ideas. So I'll, I'll end with a, a quote by Martin Luther King, which is, nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. In other words, I think it's really important we make every effort to increase awareness about these issues and debate in society and prepare society to hear what we have to say. Thank you very much. <laughs>